Okay, sorry about that, man. No problem. No problem. These days are long. It's hard. It's hard to get a break sometimes. I know. I know what you mean. You know. Let me. Um... Hi, thank you for joining me. I have a special guest with me. He is a screenwriter and author of the new book Black Magic: What Black Leaders Learn from Trauma and Triumph. Please help me welcome Chad Sanders. Chad, how are you, my friend? I'm doing pretty good, man. Thanks for having me. No problem. Uh, we want to talk about the book Black Magic. Um, it was birthed out of your need to see uh, a place or a space for you within the corporate infrastructure, uh, that, that, that Fortune 500, uh, I guess, culture. Um, how did that journey come about? Well, I was, when I had the idea for the book, I had been working in corporate America in technology for about five, six years. Uh, the first four years of those of that of that part of my career was in Silicon Valley. I was working for Google. Um, well, I should say the first year was in Silicon Valley. Then I was in London, New York, um, working for for that company, that mammoth. And then I moved over to a tech startup to try to get a little bit closer to um, where the money was, frankly, which was kind of the highest the highest levels of a company. And uh, Kaplan came in and bought that tech startup. And so then once again, I was back toward the bottom of a huge corporate structure. And I was looking at the way things move around in that industry, technology specifically. And it just felt like to make any real money. And I'm not talking about, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. I'm talking about millions of dollars, billions of dollars even. Uh, you needed to be in the C-suite. In, at the founding level or in the, on the board. And when I looked at companies in my industry, technology, most of the people, the overwhelming majority of the people who were in those seats were white men. And I wanted answers as a 26, 27 year old as to how am I supposed to get into that spot if I am a black man uh, or if I am anybody that's not a white man. And that was really the inception or sort of the beginning of me going to do the research which was to ask Black people who had had huge successes in multiple different industries how they did it um, and how they sort of used the gifts that they gained through their Blackness as opposed to hiding from those to navigate corporate America and, and kind of get where they wanted to go. Hmm. Uh, many in our culture, black the Black culture, probably have never experienced the corporate uh, world um, what is that culture like for young black people, particularly young, young black men? Well, I can speak specifically to the tech industry, which is very white. You know, it's uh, an industry that is made up of what I would describe as sort of frat boys, um, which is, you know, funny because I myself was in a fraternity, but I went to an HBCU. So it's kind of a different identity. But, you know, I'm talking about um, scruffy faces, t-shirts, uh, you know, cargo shorts, thong sandals, like that, that kind of look, those are the, those are the, that's what the founders of these companies look like. And then the culture trickles down. So if you think about a Mark Zuckerberg, if you think about, um, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, the founders of Google, if you think about Steve Jobs, um, we're talking about people who look like that. And then most of the culture within those companies is aspirational it thinks of those characters as aspirational and so people very much emulate and reflect that sort of image so think about a stanford frat house um that's basically what the industry looks like if you can imagine that mm, yes absolutely did you ever feel like you had to dumb down or mask your blackness yeah i did when i first started working at google i would say I, so I went to Morehouse College for, co for college. Uh, I lived in Atlanta for four years. Before that, I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is a suburb of D.C., so a uh, pretty diverse area. Um, when I got out to Silicon Valley, that was my first experience being in a place that felt almost entirely white. And I didn't know how to be myself in such an environment. I thought that to be a part of the club, to, to be able to build a network, to be able to get opportunities, to be able to get a raise, to get a promotion, 
I needed to act like and look like the people who I saw at the top of the power structure. And those were white guys. So I changed my wardrobe. I changed what my interests were. I started listening to different music. I started going to different types of parties. You know, I, I put on that blue button up and khakis to try to look like some sort of version of the white Stanford frat boy, because I thought that was what I was going to do to trick these people into believing that I was like them because I thought that was necessary to, to move upward there. And at some point in the first year, probably around the eight month mark, I just found myself very unhappy. Um, I was putting on a mask every day. I was putting on a costume every day, not just in the way that I, what I wore and how I spoke, but I was actually trying to make myself be someone different, to believe different things, to think different things, to want different things so that I could be just like the people I was around and it hurt. So I eventually had to stop. Hmm. I'm curious about your, uh, your, your relationships, maybe back, home, back at home and in Atlanta where you went to college. Did those relationships tend to uh, sever because of you thinking you had to be this person or put on this persona or were you able to balance it all? No, I couldn't balance it. I, I certainly frayed those relationships. Um, I, I've spoken to, you know, the fact that I lived with one of my boys from college that first year out in Silicon Valley. We were roommates and, you know, he's black. I'm black. We both worked at Google. It was our first year. We're both adjusting to a new social environment, to a new city, to a new corporate structure. And I started dodging him because I wanted to show up places alone because I thought only one black person would be welcome there. I thought only one token, you know, could be interesting or could be fun for this group of people. But if there were too many of us that I wouldn't be invited to the parties anymore, that I wouldn't be invited to the important meetings anymore. I thought, you know, the, the door was only big enough to slip my body through it and that my boy, he couldn't come along as well. And to speak to my relationships with people who weren't there, you know, my friends back home, um, or in other cities who had graduated from Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, and gone to other gone to other industries in other places, those those relationships suffered as well because I was forming an identity around somebody that I was not, and so I was ornery. You know, I was um, hard to get along with. I was I wasn't vulnerable. I wasn't honest because I was putting on an act because I thought that's what I had to do to get by where I lived and. My friends were patient, you know, at first they um, withstood this kind of new persona that I was putting on and they, they, you know, I wouldn't say they accepted it, but they tolerated it for a while. And after some point of time, I think just so much, um, just bad vibes, just negativity that I was projecting because I was in such an uncomfortable place really started to wear some of those friendships down and some of them didn't make it. Wow, wow, wow. You interviewed 200 people for this book and only 15 actually made it in. Um, uh, before we get into it, and we want to kind of discuss some of the interviews, but before we get into that, the title is Black Magic. Now we've heard uh, Black Girl Magic, we've heard Black Magic in other contexts. Uh, what inspired it for this particular work? So I guess it was a triple entendre. Um, so to the first point, this book is about everything that we learn as black people just surviving in this country and in the world at large that teaches us different ways to be creative, be adaptive, be persistent, be faithful, be intelligent, be perceptive. And I wanted to capture those lessons and very discreetly identify them, describe them, and research them in the lives of the people in this book so that others could learn from them and see them clearly in themselves. And I guess to the second point, the reason why I thought the name was particularly poignant for me was that these lessons we learn, they are born of trauma. They are, they do come from dark experiences. They do come from pain and suffering in many instances. And to go into the closet where we bury them and pull them out and dust them off and look at them again is scary. 
And sometimes I think we have to look at something that scares us. We have to delve into something that scares us to make something beautiful and make something useful to us. And that's, that's really where the name came from. And, um, you know, I do want to give a nod to, to black girl magic, you know, which I also think is a very, I think it stands on its own as a very special term and, and it, and it evokes a very special and specific type of magic. Um, one that I don't have. So uh, I thought that the name um, was powerful when I when I first started to wrap my brain around it years ago. Indeed, powerful indeed. Uh, you interviewed 200 people and only 15 made it. Give us a few of those names. And these are very prominent people in their industry. Uh, give us some couple of those, those names. Yeah, um, DeRay McKesson, Jason Crane, Ed Bailey, Brian Shields, Letitia Thomas, uh, Andrea Taylor, Jewel Burke Solomon, you know, these are people who I think to the naked eye, people don't know who they are, um, but they are titans in their industries. Uh, Jewel and Jason built a company called Part Pick, a, so a, a hardware recognition software about five years ago and sold it to Amazon. Um, now Jewel Burke Solomon is the head of Google startups in the U.S., um, Andrea Taylor is a very successful uh, apparel entrepreneur based out of Los Angeles. Um, Ed Bailey is a major consultant and career coach to, to Silicon Valley executives as well as a sports agent. Um, Letitia Thomas is one of the few black women ever, relatively, who has been able to raise you know a few million dollars in venture capital to build a business out in out in um, she's based out of San Francisco. So. You know, if I go through one by one, I could also, you know, there's um, Dr. McKinley Grant, who is a dermatologist um, based out of Washington, D.C. You know, there's just, these 15 people are, in my opinion, superheroes who, who hide in plain sight, you know, because uh, we don't always tell the story of the Black academic who withstands racism at MIT or Stanford or Harvard you know, all the way through to their PhD, and then does 30 years of scientific research. We don't always tell the story about the black pair of founders who build a technology and sell it to a big company. You know, these aren't, these aren't zinger headlines, the way that we talk about, you know, rappers and athletes and movie stars. So I wanted to highlight their stories, because I think many black people, young black people can relate to them and can relate to their aspirations because maybe they're not going to be movie stars. Maybe they're not going to be singers, um, but they're superheroes in their own right. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I'm curious, is there anybody that you interviewed out of the 200 that did not make it to the book that you wish had? Oh, man. Um, the short answer is yes, uh, but I can't mention their names because of, uh, you know, privacy issues. But I will say this, the people who made it into the book, um, they did so because they were brave and bold and honest in the way that they told their stories. They did not hedge around talking about the first time that a white friend called him a nigger, talking about um, promotions that they missed because they were black, talking about uh, fights that they got into because of racial epithets. You know, they did not skirt around in any regard um, or, or, or eschew the hard and painful truths. And I'm glad they didn't because they make the lessons that come out of those truths much more believable and much more honest. And, you know, some of the interviews that didn't make it were with people who had bigger household names. And those people wanted to protect those names from upsetting or angering white colleagues, white managers, white clients, white audiences, white customers. Um, and honestly, probably even from upsetting black audiences and black customers and black clients, you know, they wanted to, to hide from that sort of friendly fire as well. So I just, I want to sort of publicly just say thank you to the store, to the people who put their stories in here because they are grave and they are dirty and they, and they are rough. They're not polished. Mm, so good. Uh, I think there's a, a misconception, uh, amongst the black community. Um, and you can speak to this more better than I, but that people who end up in the upper echelons of particularly technology, um, Silicon Valley, if they're black, they grew up either in a middle class or rich family, or they 
were uh, acclimated to a certain class of people in their younger years. Um, you typically don't see someone coming from the hood into these spaces. Can you speak to that at all? Yes, I can. Um, that's a total misconception. White people in this country, the median wealth for a white family hovers around one hundred ten to one hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars. For black families, that number is around four thousand dollars. So, uh, at a ratio of twenty five thirty to one, we are in the economic disadvantage to our white counterparts in most regards, which means the black folks that you see at the top of these big companies, if they've made it there, I'll just speak to the subjects in my book. If you, if you look at them, um, Silicon Valley executives, uh, ag academics at the highest level trained at MIT and Stanford and researched in Harvard. Um, these people come, came from poverty, many of them lower, lower class, lower middle class, um, just everyday people, you know, out of the projects, out of the West side of Chicago, you know, wherever. And what you might see on them that looks like a background of privilege is often a trained way of affect polished so that white people accept them into white spaces. That's not where they're coming from. That's a mask that they're putting on that's hard to take off when you go back into black spaces. And so when we push away the idea of our own people who have accomplished and when we other them because we think that they were born on second base and ended up hitting a home run, I think it's to our own disadvantage. I think it's, I, I think it's a way of you know, perpetuating hopelessness because a lot of these people have come very far. I came from a middle-class household. So I, I raised my hand to say that, uh, but the people who I am, have talked to in this book, many of them um, come, come as first generation college educated uh, children to parents who had, you know, not even high school educations come straight out of public housing and they did it anyway. Wow, wow, wow. Your book uh, definitely speaks to your relationship with um, our counterparts, the white people, both in corporate uh, professional spaces as well as personal. Uh, I'm curious, in your experience, do they get this Black struggle? Do they really get it? I think it's really hard for anybody, even the most well-meaning ally, to understand where somebody's been without being there. Uh, empathy in many cases requires experience and I don't think they get it. I think that's, you know, probably a secondary reason why I wrote the book. The primary reason was because I wanted for myself and for other people like me, I wanted to understand the journey that black people take to get to the life that they want professionally but the secondary reason I wrote this book is I wanted other people to see their stories in such detail, in such a cinematic way that they could visualize them and begin to wrap their brains around just how special and how gifted these people are to make it out of whatever they came out of. And now, as I'm having conversations with white people who have read this book, what I'm hearing them say is, you know, we throw around these terms. Um, so theoretically, we throw around the idea of poverty and violence and police brutality and racism. We throw them around very theoretically now, but it's hard to really wrap your brain around what it looks like step by step for somebody to run into those walls over and over and over again in their careers or in their educational backgrounds. And in this book, I really try to walk them through it with each one of these stories inch by inch so that they can feel it. And hopefully by the end of the book, um, they feel like they were there and then they can understand what, what's going on with these people. Mm -hmm. You've had an evolution in life as, as a young black man. And I'm curious if you, if you still have relationships with some of those uh, professionals in the, the white professionals from your, tele, your Silicon Valley days. And if so, 
what are they saying about the new Chad Sanders or the evolved Chad Sanders? Yeah, I do. I, I had a conversation with um, one of them yesterday, an executive from Kaplan who I had grown close to when I was working there at that company that Kaplan, Kaplan bought. Um, and, you know, what's funny and interesting is that he, I, I, when I knew him, you know, I had short hair. Um, I dressed a little bit differently, you know, I probably spoke a little bit differently. I hadn't even, I had never written a screenplay or a book, obviously. And in our conversation, I felt, I sensed that I felt just as familiar to him as ever. And I think what that speaks to is that as much as we try to hide who we are from people, I do think that there are always glimmers of who we really are that, that peek out. And I think that's what people respond to. And that's what people connect to. And so when you come back to someone as a more full or a more earnest version of yourself, um, I, I don't think in many cases, I don't think what you will find there or what I have found there is uh, shock or surprise. I think it's actually a deeper sense of familiarity. And that to me lends to a more honest exchange and a more honest friendship. And I have seen that in some of my relationships with some of my old colleagues. Yeah. Mm. What, what, what kind of conversations are you having with them regarding the racial tension that's going on? Are, is that a subject that is coming up in your conversation? Yeah. Your I, I, yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of unavoidable now. And, and to be honest, I haven't had many conversations with my old colleagues, but in this one, he was telling me, he said specifically that he's probably had since reading the book, 10 conversations with his wife. Um, just breaking down elementally everything that they didn't know that Black people across the spectrum are going through in everyday life. I mean, we're it's funny because some of these things almost feel like second nature to us. Like, you know, of course you have a white voice. You know, of course you change the way you talk a little bit in a room full of white people, the way you breathe, the way you walk, the way you stand. Um, but I think that is to a white man in his forties with, you know, some good money. Um, I think the idea of contorting yourself so significantly like that is a shock. And he, 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 he was surprised, you know, to know that even I, as someone who really projects confidence and, and I think I always have that I was feeling so um, belittled and, and so backed into a corner you know, in those environments. So uh, most of the reaction has been positive. And um, I didn't expect that, to be honest with you. I thought a lot of people were going to be hurt and angry uh, by some of the more searing words and honesty that's found in this book. And um, I have had a couple people say to me, you know, oh, you know, kids from high school, as an example, I've heard one person say, oh, I'm not really sure it was like that where we went to school, or I'm not really sure, you know, we had racism in our, in our town or whatever. But um, the, by and large, the majority of people I have seen have been receptive and kind about being able to see a different side of an, of an experience than they have previously seen. And if I'm just being honest, most of the reaction, the positive reaction from white people has come from white women, um, you know, and, and I don't know, take that at face value. I don't know what to say about it. Wow. Wow. It's beneficial either way. It's, we can, that's a good start. That's a good yeah. start. Um, I have to ask this, and I ask this because um, I know you can speak to it based on your background, but in, in, in some of our cultural, Black cultural spaces, the young people tend to think if they have to speak uh, articulately or eloquently or stand up straight or pull their pants up on their waist, that they're not being true to their culture. And if an older person, baby boomer, grandma, whoever says, no, don't talk like that or say this or shake that, they're teaching them not to be themselves. And I, I'm acting white, this whole term of acting white. Having been in this uh, space where it's nothing but white people in the upper echelons of, of society. What do you think about that? Because I tend to think that there's nothing wrong with speaking proper. There's nothing wrong with being articulate. It's not white. <laughs> you know, just because you don't talk in your dial, your, your, your 
ethnic dialect or whatever it is, your neighborhood tongue, if you will, uh, doesn't make you white or acting white. What do you what do you think about that whole concept as it pertains to that? I think the most, you know, as a writer, I would say, I think the most important thing in any form of communication is that you get your point across and that the person on the other side of the interaction understands you. Um, that is communication. So however you need to accomplish that, I recommend it. I would say uh, in, in my job as a writer and in many jobs that I've seen, is beneficial to have a mastery of the mechanics of English um, and specifically American English. So if that is something that you want to do, it behooves you to be studied that way. I would say for me personally, I have also found it an aid to be able to bend language, to be able to uh, change. You know, when I lived in London, I spoke English differently. When I am in this conversation, I speak English one particular way. When I talk to Brene Brown, I, I speak English a different way. When I talk to Dak Shepard, a white guy, I speak it a little bit differently. Um, in a writer's room, I speak it a little bit differently. You know, I think if, if your goal is to get someone to understand you, it behooves you to have as many different ways to effectively accomplish that as possible. And if somebody's not going to hear you because your pants aren't pulled up or because you look a certain way, then sure, you do have one option, which is to look the way that they want you to look. But I would say something else to consider is why do I need this person? Why do I want them to get my message? And is there a better idea for me to change my environment than to change myself so that they can hear me? Mm -hmm. Looking back at your time in uh, the technology world, had you stayed there and, uh, and pursued the goals that you wanted, what do you think you would have had to compromise? You know, I don't know. Um, when I think about that time, I was already compromising just by having the goals. I wanted to be a Fortune 500 CEO, um, or I, at least I was telling myself that. But I knew that I was unhappy. I, I could feel that I was uncomfortable and that it was an uphill climb. And I think I had wrapped my goals around what other people saw in me. Um, excuse me. I was a writer my entire, I've been a writer my entire life. I studied English in college. I was in a humanities program in middle school. I went to an art school for high school, but I got this job at Google coming out of Morehouse. And when your first job is very formative, I think, for anybody coming out of college because you don't really know who you are and you don't really have an identity yet. And so I wrapped my identity around this Silicon Valley idea of being some kind of like Mark Zuckerberg clone. When I look at my friends, I have a friend now who's the CFO. He's actually in the book. Um, he goes under the pseudonym Grayson in the book. And he's a CFO of a pretty powerful tech company. And he started off in finance. and I think that, you know, he's been able to formulate an identity around who he is as Grayson. And then when he moved into technology, he born, he was born a different dream, which was, you know, to be a CFO of a major, you know, hopefully one day a fortune 500 company. So I, I think as a person in your 20s, your goals are always shifting. Your identity is always shifting. And the most important thing, in my opinion, is to be in touch with how those things are shifting and not to hold on too tightly to something that doesn't matter to you anymore. Mm, so good. You, you interviewed, as we stated, 200 people for this book, Black Magic. 15 made it in. Um, out of those 15, which, which one of those interviews speak the loudest to you as an individual? I think that the last interview, um, Pastor Roger Jamison's, who is a pastor of a black church here in Brooklyn, um, he was a very dark skinned, uh, suicidal, alcoholic, a drug addicted, drug dealing criminal in his late teens and early 20s in the Jim Crow South. And he, you know, because of the way that 
people in the Jim Crow South at that time treated him because of his black skin, he became, he began to hate his black skin. He thought it was a curse on him. And, you know, he was able to dig himself out of literally almost killing himself into a place in a position of self-love around his blackness over the course of two very difficult, you know, very traumatic decades. And on the other end of that, now he's one of the most prolific uh, social justice, I'm sorry, social workers in New York, not social justice. He works with addicts. He works with at-risk youth. He works with inmates. And his work is largely, I would say, benefited by the fact that he can relate to somebody who hates themselves because of their blackness and what it affords them or what it costs them in this, in this country. So that to me, because of how far, how far he came in terms of going from self-hate to self-love around his blackness, that is sort of the, the, the ultimate black magic story to me. Mm. Wow, wow. In this book, you, you talk about the uh, lessons or should I, I like to call them gifts that we have as, as Blacks uh, and some of them being empathy, you know, faith, resourcefulness. Which, which of those are you leaning on most in this season? I'm, I'm curious. In this season of my life, um, I would say uh, vision and intuition. Uh, both of those to me are very connected to what you feel in your body. Um, I pay really close attention to how things feel right now in my life. Uh, when a new opportunity arises, when new people arrive in my life, um, I listen closely to the little voices that tell you stuff about those things and those people. And I think I used to try to ignore those voices because I was given a script that said, you go to college, you go work at Google, you go work at a startup, then you go try to become CEO guy. You know, I was following steps. And I think that God lives in our bodies. I think he tells us sort of what the steps are by based on how things feel. And that gives me sort of the vision to move forward at every, at every given entryway. Mm -hmm. You've been amongst the brightest and best in, in business and technology. I'm curious, uh, what trait or skill set have you adapted that is working for you in this new space of yours? Um, I'm really scrappy. Uh, I, I've seen that as a defining characteristic of people who I admire. Um, Spike Lee is a, is a great example of that. You know, he is scrappy. Uh, if you you know, if you give him a million dollars to make a movie, he'll make a movie. If you give him $10 million to make a movie, he'll make a movie. If you give him $30 million to make a movie, he'll make a movie. He's, he is by definition resourceful. And I, I think I came into this industry already with a sense of resourcefulness. Just how do you make something out of nothing and working at it, working at going after opportunities, trying to make the most of those opportunities, and also trying to make a profit, you know, trying to make some good money in this thing. I have had to lean into that sort of scrappiness to collect resources so that I can make stuff and also put something in my piggy bank. Yeah, so true. Well, before we get out of here, I've got to ask about your book collection there behind you. I, I'm admiring oh, yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, reader are you? Of course, you're a writer, but what kind of reader are you? Are you cover to cover? Are you chapter <laughs> highlight study? What, what kind of reader are you? Yeah, it depends. And I got to say, I got to shout out my girlfriend, Juliana, because a lot of these books are hers as well. Oh. But um, I, I, that's a really good question. I, I can be a little OCD about finishing books, which doesn't mean that I finish all of them, but I do feel uh, like a, a, twin, a tinge of pain, a twinge when I don't finish a book. Um, there are some books like, I, I really like self-help books. So, you know, Tim Ferriss's like four hour work week and uh, tools of Titans. When I pick up books like those, um, I tend to jump around. I tend to find something that looks interesting to me. And I really dig into that. Um, Tim Ferriss also was an inspiration for me as an author. He was somebody who I think um, is generous in the way that he compiles information and shares it so that you don't have to be tortured by the process of reading what's written there, but you can really just take the medicine and it goes down easy. So 
that that's that's who I am as a reader. There is one book on that shelf. I don't know exactly where it is, but um, on writing by Stephen King is uh, a book that reshaped the way that I thought about writing. And I also want, I don't know even know if it's on that shelf or if it's in the living room, but um, Bad Feminist by Roxane Gay, you know, I, obviously there's, there's, there's so much there in terms of just like uh, principles and theory of being a malleable feminist, um, which is something, you know, I got to work at and I think everybody needs to work at. But besides that, just her writing style to me is so spare and so just, it just is like bullets. It's just to the point, you know, bullets. I mean, like of a gun, not like on paper. It's just like, it feels like she knows what she thinks. And that to me is the most important part of reading is like, does this author know what they think? Are they telling me what they think? And, you know, that's, that's someone else I admire. That's, that's well said. You mentioned that Stephen King book and I own that book, but it was so, and I'm not going it, to, it's so hard for me to get it. I tried years ago to read it and I just couldn't, yeah. So I may have to pick it up again. I may have to yeah. pick it up again. You know, he's yeah. he's um he's an old white guy that lives in New Hampshire. So in that way, you know, I think some of his story can be unrelatable, but I personally really respond to the way that he writes, which is just so so clean and so clear. Um, and also a little tongue in cheek. I, I personally like that about his writing. So maybe give it another shot when you can. I am. I am. I am. You mentioned uh, self-help books and all that. How would you classify this book, Black Magic? Would you consider it a self-help? I would call it, uh, yeah, I would call it a, a self-help book mixed with a uh, personal memoir. That's what I would say. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it does. Um, for as much as I wanted it to be just written in, you know, parables about here's how you get to the top as a black person, um, it really became very flush with emotion and spirit. And I think it, I personally think that it runs the entire roller coaster of happy, sad, angry, um, funny. Mm, so good. So good. You guys be sure to get black magic by Chad Sanders. Chad, tell us where we can get the book and connect with you. Yeah, you can get the book anywhere that books are sold. Um, you can follow me at Chad Sand on Instagram. You can follow me at Chad underscore Sand on Twitter. Uh, you can check out my website, uh, which is archerchad.com. And um, you'll see me around. I'm writing for uh, Issa Rae's new show, Rap Shit, right now. Um, I have my own show coming to Peacock. How to Survive Inglewood. I have a movie coming with Universal called One and Done. And uh, I'll just, I'll be here. So yeah, yeah. Well, I'll we'll see have you. to connect. We'll have to connect when that movie comes out and talk some more about that. Thanks, man. No problem. No problem. My best to you. And, and thank you for representing and, and, and being uh, I get bold about who you are. We appreciate that. Thank you, Cornell. All righty. Take care. All right. All right. Bye-bye.